Hey, Sarah. Hey, Veronica. We're back again for another episode. We're keeping a scheduled appearance. Or um, what is what is appearance when it's sound? Um, ear appearance. Welcome to another episode of Thick as Thieves. This is the podcast about art crime hosted by me and Veronica. And we are two criminal defense investigators with backgrounds in art. And this is the place that we come to talk about art destruction and murder yeah. and heist and crime. Yeah, anything where crime and art intersect. Uh, those of you who are new, a uh, recap, intro. Uh, our first season, we focused on heists because we, I mean, heists are really interesting and we, Very we, haven't, even, we haven't even covered all the heists we want to cover. And in the second season, we devoted about four or five or even six episodes to art vandalism destruction. And Mm -hmm. that was fun to talk about, but it did get to a point where there's only really so much you can say about a moment where someone destroys an artwork and Mm -hmm. you don't have as much of like an elaborate process of trying to figure it out and why it happened. Cause it's often prank, like a prank or it's often someone didn't take their meds that morning or, you know, whatever it is, it's something that, or a mistake, like just a yeah. silly mistake that really didn't have a lot of, you know, there's not a lot of meat to that story. Yeah. But we highlighted the ones that we thought were the meatiest. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now we've gone from meaty vandalism to murder. Um, it just naturally <laughs> went in that direction, but also because an event took place three weeks ago that Sarah talked about in last in the last episode regarding Rebecca Bloom's murder. So just a quick recap of that. In July, a curator, an American curator living in Berlin was murdered by her artist boyfriend of eight years, Saul Fletcher. Um, we know that he did it because... He stabbed her and then called her daughter and told her that he did it. And then he killed himself. Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things we explored was the way people have been responding to that. A lot of people who represented him are no longer representing them, him, even if they are, they are um, getting really quiet about his presence in their, in their galleries or museum collections. So the response to this has been very different from previous incidences that were similar And because we talked about that last week, I thought we'll talk about another situation that's kind of similar that had a very different response in the 80s. So this is a story about two visual artists and their names are Carl Andre and Anna Mendieta. Which one do you want me to start telling you about first? Let's talk about, why don't we introduce Anna first? Yeah. Who is she? So Anna was born in Cuba in 1948 in Havana. And when she was about 12 or 13 years old, her parents sent her to the States as a part of like a a weird asylum refugee type program because they were very politically driven and activists. And so children of uh, people who resisted were in danger. So there's this weird program called the Peter Pan program or something that took, (laughs) took all these kids from Cuba and place them in the States. So Anna and her sister left Cuba, left their parents, and ended up in Iowa, of all places. And not just that, in a really brutal orphanage Mm -hmm. that was run by nuns, where they had a horrible experience. Like, it was like what you would imagine with a torturous nun orphanage in the Midwest in this situation. So that gives you a little context. That's what she grows up in. And that's the setting in which she decides she wants to become an artist. So she goes to college. She goes to the University of Iowa and she studies film. And then she goes on to keep studying, like goes to a graduate program there and becomes an artist who is what she called like an earth body artist. So this is... When was this? What what time period? So this is the 70s. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So she... So very interesting time to study film. Well, she was studying film right before that. She was kind of um, in Iowa for a minute, but she moved to New York in 1978. 
she started becoming involved with the whole feminist performance art scene. But her her thing was a bit different. First of all, she didn't really like the title feminism. Like she didn't associate with that. Maybe it was just the way it was being defined at the time because she's a feminist. Like she was one. Um, I mean, the work she made was very much in response to especially male violence and that sort of thing. Because when she was in college, uh, a friend of hers was raped and she one of her first artworks, if you look her up online, there's this iconic photo of her naked in a classroom Room. It looks like a classroom and she's just smearing blood down the wall. And it's it's actually a really lovely photograph. That's a weird descriptor to use, but it's very visually um, enticing. But also it was about that without using any words or anything. She she was making all this work in Iowa that involved using blood and dirt. And often people be like, where are you getting this blood from? And it's Iowa. There's slaughterhouses everywhere. So she would just go get the blood from them. That's like, that's oh, intense. Bovine blood. And um, okay. yeah, so her work was initially very blood oriented. And there's a documentary about her called Blood Work. I have not seen it. So sometimes when people think of her, they think of that. They think of that piece. I don't. That's not the first one I go to, but that gives you context in her background. And so she goes to New York in the 70s. She's a part of the mostly just like female performance art kind of milieu that's existing there at the time. And at the same time, earthworks are really popular. Um, they're all the rage. But they're, she's looking at those works mostly made by men. And the way these people, these male artists would create their literal dent in the earth was they would get a lot of heavy machinery. They would get the funding to go to places with bulldozers and dr like giant drills, helicopters, and you know, the ultimate little boy dream to go and like <laughs> get to just carve up the earth and turn it into whatever you want. So she was seeing that and that's how majority of those artists were making the work. And she wanted to do her own response, which was very different. It was more like she would create an imprint in the ground from her body. And this was a series called Silhouettas. And then mm -hmm. she would she would fill it with put different elements in it, like gunpowder in one, herbs in another, leaves, grass, mud, stones, like natural elements. She had them all in little vials in her studio. There's definitely a spiritual element to her work. She was really into Santeria. And so she's not going to arbitrarily pick one. It will have some kind of connection to something spiritual. Mm -hmm. So while she was in New York and she was starting to kind of blow up, she then went to Cuba. She was able to return to Cuba. And she was doing some project there where she went into like a cave and did cave drawings. So you nice. can see why I like her. Like, Oh yeah, you love caves. I love caves. I like- Cavernous liked, adventures. Yeah. I like spells. <laughs> I, I, like, I like feminism. <laughs> you like tarot cards? Yeah. So uh, she's- I mean, that's, this doesn't have to do with it, but I feel like she would like tarot cards if you showed she would. them to her. Oh yeah. If you showed <laughs> them to her. Especially your um, Agnes Var. What what tarot cards do you have? Agnes Varda tarot cards. Pretty oh, good. you're what? thinking of the Bergman. Bergman. Ingmar oh, yeah. Bergman. Bergman. <laughs> yeah, the Bergman tarot. So it's like all stills from Bergman films. In yes. fact, I'm just gonna go run over and grab it and hold it while we're talking, and I'll pull yes. a card towards the end of the episode. <laughs> Why not? Let's do it. I love it. <laughs> this is gonna be our most spiritual episode. Okay, so she goes back to her homeland, and then she comes. Did you back. get your cards? Wait, did you get your cards? Yes. I'm going to take them out and give them energy as I talk about Anna Mandietta. Charge them up. And then I'll ask them a question about this story. That's Perfect. my plan. Okay. So Anna Mandietta comes back to New York and that is when she meets Carl Andre. So we'll talk about him in a second, even though okay. he's not as cool as Anna Mandietta. For the record. He's, he's a part of this story. Um, she had a like a solo art show at this gallery at the time called, I don't know if it was pronounced air, but it was A-I-R that only showed female artists in New York City at the time. Okay. So like Nancy Spiro, Carly Schneeman, all of those people. And so she comes right. back and she has a show there and then she meets Carl Andre. Are you familiar with Carl Andre? A little bit, but not, not a ton. Does I hear his name, name all the time, but... Yeah. So I'm not going to go into him too much. I'm going to just kind of summarize Carl Andre. I'll, I'll start with this. When I go into a show at a museum, typically it's one in this country. Also, the Tate in England has quite a few of his works. The fun part about going and seeing his work is his work is usually on the floor. Does he do like super minimal or is it like 
or is it earthy stuff? No, very, very minimal. But what you typically see of his work in like, especially group exhibition is a grid on the floor, very visible. So everyone walks around it. And it's like, I've done this a few times with people who are like, okay, I'm going to an art museum. I don't really like art museums, but I'm going to go. And then you walk into a room and there's this grid in the middle. No one, everyone's walking around it. And then I love to like stomp around on it. And then whoever I'm with is, oh my God. And I'm, I'm just, there's a guard who's not telling me anything. And I'm like, this is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed Mm -hmm. to walk on his art. It's usually made out of the same material that makes railroad tracks. And that's his whole thing. He he was initially so like railroad ties, like those things, or what do you mean the material used to make it? Like the metal, the, the metal. Okay, okay. Um, so not like high high quality stuff, but just that hardcore metal because that's what he had done for a while. Like he went to New York. He wanted to be an artist. He was very moved by Stonehenge. <laughs> um, he goes to New York. He somehow gets to share a studio with what's his face, Frank. Is it Frank Stella? He's the one who does like just kind of big, colorful, right? Well, colorful, abstract things. Frank Stella, yeah. yeah. Or he does like a big, um, you know, he'll do a collage, a super messy collage, and they're gigantic. And you go inside, you can like walk into them, like they're like a little spiral. And they're huge structures. Though. That's the thing. His art is no. That's huge. are you talking about Richard Serra? No, I'm thinking okay. about Frank Stella. What I'm mixing? Yeah, I'm mixing them up. That sounds like a Richard Serra sculpture You're to me. One hundred percent right. See, everybody, this is why we need to do this together. <laughs> because if I start suddenly thinking Frank Stella is Richard Serra, Sarah is gonna be like, hold on a second. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, it's just because I, you know, I like Frank Stella a lot. And he's definitely like super colorful. One of my favorite paintings by him right. was in I San Diego. Them up. Mm-hmm. But at least you're very, you know what you're, you have the vision in your head. Of I have what it is. Now I do. Mm-hmm. Now that I've, I just <laughs> took their names and scrambled them around. I mean, I mean, you know, there was a lot of them at that time. Yeah. So he was with Stella. Okay. And no, S- Sarah or Stella, which one? <laughs> he was with Stella. Okay. He, yes. It. Stella was the one he shared a studio with. Okay. So that's in the late 50s. And that's when Carl Andre made his first major sculpture. And it was called The Last Ladder. But then he went back to Massachusetts, where he was from. And he worked as a freight brakeman and railway conductor for a few years. And that's what his dad had done. And then his grandfather had been a bricklayer. So he went back to this line of work that involved working with heavy materials, hard work that you're not getting paid enough for. You know, that that experience that's formative to a lot of these, I mean, not a lot of these artists, but some of these artists who are making Mm -hmm. these heavy sculptures, these heavy, big, masculine sculptures. So when he went back to New York, he just basically took what he was doing as a railway conductor and a brakeman and using those materials that he saw every day and putting them into the art scene. There were magnesium plates and steel and aluminum. And he just took off. He had a, his first solo exhibition in 1965. That's just a few years after he gets back from working. No, that's literally the year I think he gets back. He has his first solo exhibition. And like the world went, when I say the world, I mean New York went crazy. And he, within five years, had his first solo exhibition at the Guggenheim, which was oh, crazy wow. at the time. I think he was only 30 years old or 35. Yeah, I think he was. 35 years old, which is really young to have a solo show at the Guggenheim in New York, considering. I wonder if that's one of the youngest. I think the youngest. By now, probably someone who's 18. Sure. But at that time, definitely there was more of a, you got to pave your way. Yeah. Pay your dues is what I'm, pave your way. (laughs) Pave your way by paying (laughs) your dues. So yeah, he has a huge show in 1970. So he's like a fucking star. And, you know, with his power, he he's like got one of the main roles in creating the Art Workers Coalition. And he's just, he can basically do anything he wants mm-hmm. as an artist. He meets Anna Mendieta and she's starting to become recognized. And they, I guess you would call this falling in love, but I think it's more called, I don't know, just two giant egos mm-hmm. having a spark moment you know? Right. So they meet like in the early eighties, like 1981. What's the age difference between them? Is Um, there one or are they about the same age? There's an age difference. It's not dramatic. It's about 13 years. So she's 13 years younger than him. They get married in Rome a couple years later. And I read the story about their wedding in Rome. It was, it sounded crazy. Like she was there for- Oh, do tell. A fellowship of some sort. And- 
they've been together maybe a year. They drank a lot. And when their friends would come hang out with them and eat dinner, they just like threw shit at each other in restaurants. One of those couples. Yeah. And then their marriage in Rome, I think was pretty um, spontaneous and romantic in a way, but very chaotic in terms of how they were acting that night. I think what initially drew them to each other is the exact thing that made them want to kill each other all the time. Right. Now, I don't think she actually wanted to kill him. I just think like they were just at each other's throats all the time. Because I'm sure so, they both had really strong personalities, strong opinions, strong stances on things. And that's probably, you're right, that's probably what drew them to each other is their minds and their uniqueness and they're willing to like follow their own like gut feelings and vision and all of that, which is, you know, the wonderful thing about some of these artists, but that can also be a very uncompromising type of personality. Yeah, exactly. So I'm going to read a little description I wrote about what's the next event I'm going to talk about. So this is something I wrote years ago because I tried to write a story about them. And um, just if we can go into this, if we feel like it, but I, I had to get image permission and we got image permission from um, Ana Mendieta's estate, but Carl Andre said, hell no. And then we were going to go ahead and publish the story with Ana Mendieta images and like have the absence of his images kind of speak to mm-hmm. the situation. And then even though they signed a contract with us, we got a call from the state like the day after he told us that we couldn't and they're like, we're pulling out. We can't. And wow, his people must have gotten in touch with them. And okay, well, so we'll t- table that and talk about it in a second if you feel like it. But um, yeah. I, I think we should talk about it. I think that's kind of stuff's interesting too. Yeah. All right. So here we go. Ana Mendieta watched the film Without Love the night she drunkenly stumbled 34 stories from her bedroom window in New York City. Or the night she willingly leapt to her death or the night she was murdered. The film's depressing love story mixed with a bottle of champagne, the remnants of takeout Chinese food, and the sticky summer air left bad taste in her mouth. Her husband, Carl Andre, watched the credits roll as she fluttered around him. They bickered about the film's story, about ideal love, about who was the better artist. It was one of those nights that crept far too deep into zombie drunkenness when sleep ceases to be an appealing activity and daybreak seems like a potential apocalypse. It was stifling in the apartment, and their last conversation was not a loving one. On September 8th, 1985, Andre called 911 to report a suicide. When asked by the operator to elaborate, he said, What happened was, my wife is an artist, and I am an artist. And we quarreled about the fact that I was more uh, exposed to the public than she was. And she went to the bedroom, and I went after her, and she went out the window. That is the exact... Oh, wow. That is the exact 911 recording. That's like verbatim transcripts. Verbatim. Yeah, because I read a book that the detective what? wrote about this case. Uh, the detective's name is Robert Katz, and he wrote a book called Naked by the Window, The Fatal Marriage of Andre and Mendieta. And he goes through this entire... It is like 400 pages long. And so he provides that 911 transcript in the book. But also, that was um, aired in the courtroom because Andre was charged with her murder, but... The trial went on for three years and he was acquitted. They mm-hmm. played that recording to everyone in the courtroom where he's, his wife just fell out a window of a, the 34th story of a building in New York. And the first mm-hmm. thing he says is, my wife an is artist. an artist and I am an artist. Who yeah. says that? Let's unpack this. Let's unpack yeah. this 911 call. Yeah. Okay. So typically uh, you and I have both heard many 911 calls at this yeah. point. Um, our jobs entail a lot of going back and listening to all sorts of records like that. And even if it's not a murder per se, even if it's just an accident or something, you know, something terrible has happened. Almost always the first thing is if someone's actually involved or on the scene or in it, I mean, they're screaming about the thing that's happening. Yeah. That's the first thing, you know, it's, it would be, my wife is dead. My wife is dead. Something like that. It would be, um, she can't breathe. It would be, she can't, you know, something like that. It's, it's always like the immediate thing that's happening is usually the first right words, unless the operator is like adamantly asking for their whereabouts or something, you know, with their location, but almost always it's like the immediate thing. Yeah. So the fact that the very last thing was that he said, Oh, and she went out the window. <laughs> 
Yeah, whatever he that's, said. that's the last thing. He takes a while to get there. Um, the recording from the way it's described sounded extremely monotone, like he didn't care. And I think you can hear it maybe if you sleuth around the internet enough, you can find it somewhere. It's probably in one of the documentaries about her. But yeah, I mean, just to kick it off with that. He kicked it. So what, read it again. Sorry. Okay, so here now I'm wildly interested in this. <laughs> okay, so he calls nine one one. The operator's like nine one one. What's your emergency or whatever? <laughs> and he says verbatim, "My wife is an artist and I am an artist, and we quarreled about the fact that I was more uh, exposed to the public than she was. And she went to the bedroom, and I went after her, and she went out the window. That's so. The phrase she went out the window." is oh. very bizarre. I know because it doesn't, it's not saying she jumped out the window or she fell out the window yeah, or any, or, you know, some, yeah, that's, it's so, she went as if she just very casually walked outside the window and never came back. Yeah. And because, you know, I re- I read this book by a detective who's kind of our counterpart. You know, we we're investigators. We're not detectives, but detectives do what we do with way more power and resources. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So this detective, he went and looked at the window. It is, she was like five, two. Mm -hmm. It is a window that I think the ledge comes up to her, the middle of her chest, the, the bottom ledge. Right. So for her to just fall out the window is a little hard. She would have had to have jumped up on the thing and then jumped out the window. But just judging from the fact that he was very blatantly and openly violent with her. Which we haven't really touched on that. So, so we've, you know, I feel like we talked about in Rome, she, they had like a quarrelsome to use his term. They had a quarrelsome marriage. It sounds like they were bickering and and kind of throwing things. Were were they physically abusive? Was that like out in the open? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, typically she would sort of, just judging from accounts that I read from people that were around them, she would find his sort of male ego side very openly annoying and she would bring it up. She would like challenge him at the table. That was her constant thing to to challenge him or to have an issue with something. And then he would get really angry and then he would start to be violent and she would be violent back. Uh, mm-hmm. But he's like gigantic and is she's he? tiny. What does he's he look like? like? Describe him. Um, I'm trying to... So the pictures I saw of him when he was around that time, he's like got a beard, tall, lumberjacky looking. I'm going to Google. I'm going to so Google. They got him. married in 1984. Yeah. Tell us what he looks like. Okay. He looks like an Amish man. <laughs> He looks like a, <laughs> uh, this is in his, uh, elder stage. Oh yeah. You're looking at his old man photos. Very old, very Amish. Cause he's in his eighties now. Okay. Let's go Carl Andre 1984. Or even if we look at their pictures of their wedding, which I, there should be some online unless he's somehow found the power to scrub the internet of that. Um, oh, there's one of him looking very lumberjacky. Okay. Like long beard, balding. Yes. All right. Okay. That's not the type of person I was picturing. I was picturing like a handsome Spanish oh, not at all. guy. He's from Massachusetts. He's a class A mass hole. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and that's him. And he's way taller than her. Yeah. Okay. So she went, she went out the window to quote him. She went out the window. Yeah. Okay. Got it. <laughs> and then in the time that follows, I guess he gets his shit together and it's being seen as a suicide. He's acting so weird when the cops arrive. There's so many fishy details that the cops are like, this looks like murder to us. Cause and- it almost always is. I mean, when, when a female gets murdered, it's almost always her partner. Yeah. Oh, it's so true. uh, The statistics are very high. I shouldn't say almost always, but... I agree with you there. So that is what happens. Now, here's a weird thing too. So she falls from the 34th 34th floor of a building onto the roof of of a deli. And there's this odd thing where her artwork had been largely about the imprint of the body... Oh, God. ...in the earth. And then but ceremonial and she would pick the elements that she would put over it. And it, and then her death is her body putting an imprint in a building essentially. I mean, I don't, I haven't, but it's weird. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. 
Wow. Um, yeah. So the more evidence they gather, the more it points at Andre, his behavior is super weird regarding the situation during the trials. Um, but he has money and he has a badass lawyer who gets him out. He's acquitted. Mm -hmm. And then besides some like uproar from mostly a feminist art group within New York, he continues to be a very successful and powerful artist. It seems like there are no consequences to it at all. And what, what about was, the reporting? Was there any, I mean, was there reporting on the fact that he, I, I don't know. I mean, I try and think of like, I mean, this is not an, an adequate comparison, but like the OJ thing, I feel like at the time there were, there were a decent amount of people who were on the side of he's definitely guilty and were, you know, reporting that and talking about that. And then there were people on the other side. Was this anything similar or was it more just... Yeah, the media had fun with people it. People were disinterested. The media was like, famous artist kills wife. That's, you know, you're getting those headlines. But the art world didn't fucking care. Like the power, the powers in the art world were like, whatever. It was actually Frank mm -hmm. Stella that bailed him out like $50,000 bail. Wow. And all the dudes in that scene mm -hmm. came together. And then a lot of the women in that scene separated from them and they were like, fuck you guys. But their voice wasn't powerful enough. It, it really right. had no consequence. I mean, there was a solo show after she died of her work, like a retrospective at the New Museum, which is very different at the time. The New Museum had just started. And so when, they di when she died, they did a retrospective of her work. Like she was important, but she was tiny in comparison to how big of a deal he was. If you want to think of it in terms of the access he had, the exhibitions that he could get like that, the money that, like the value of his artwork. I mean, he was just mm -hmm. operating at another level. And so this was, was this was in 1985. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the art world was so, so, so different then. I mean, female artists had barely even really made a dent in anything at all. I mean, they they had done a lot, but it wasn't... It, I feel like the audience for it and the way and how seriously it was taken didn't go much beyond their own milieu. Um, right, of course. I mean, they were doing a ton to promote female artists. And yeah, you've got like Spiro and Judy Chicago and all those people like who were working and, and promoting the female artists. I guess they were shining a light on the problem, but still it was so tiny in comparison to the like global art world that's just all it's just all men oh yeah at that time yeah they had like a gigantic men's feelings group type of situation but it's skyscrapers and <laughs> some really um amazing real estate and mm -hmm. dollars they were rich <laughs> they had power so andre was like off the hook and even and like, they just had a force field of support and when you have that, I mean, we see it, you know, when it comes to, you know, all of the like sexual assault stuff that's happening all over the country at this, well, all, all over the world, but specifically this country, I mean, you see how important um, it can be if someone has a, an endless financial support and they're like group of homies that are going to keep them in their profession and keep them uh, at the top of whatever they're doing. Um, oh yeah. And, and I mean, the media was still interested in the story. So there are examples of some of his homies being interviewed because they're like, how, what's it like being friends with a murderer? You know, like questions like mm -hmm. that. And I can't remember which, uh, little shit of an artist said this, but there was this guy who's quoted in a magazine article saying, Carl Andre did not kill Anna Mendieta. She killed herself. She was hysterical. She was crazy. And then he says, if you want to look at the real culprit here, you should look at her art professor. She was sleeping with her art professor when she was in oh graduate God. school. That was a consensual relationship. Such a yeah. classic. Um, diversion. Diversion. Like, no, yeah. Trying to make her seem like she was promiscuous or that it was her fault. Like she was doing some like something bad that she, this is why this has happened to her. Right. So, I mean, there was no justice, but now let's see in 2016, I believe there was a retrospective of Andre's work in London at the Tate. The Tate loves Carl Andre for some reason, and they have a lot of his work. And, um, I don't know why I said for some reason, I mean, it's obvious why 
And I'm not going to say his work sucks. I'm also not going to say it's great, but Mm -hmm. I see why it all worked out the way it did. But there was a protest at his retrospective. And then a year later, Mocha in LA tried to do the same retrospective. And there was a much larger protest, like massive. Love that. Hell yeah. Yeah. So, you, I mean, that's what takes us back to the story you were telling two weeks ago. It's, it's like the response to these types of things for everything else that's fucked up in the world and all the disappointing things. I am happy that is a shift that mm-hmm. I think that's a shift in the right direction. So yeah, even though she was murdered and he got off the hook, he can't have a solo show without people wanting to really fuck it up. He's an old man I mean, now. Yeah, that's what I was I was going to ask if he was still alive. He's so in his he 80s. is. Like it's just crazy that that kind of thing doesn't completely eclipse his artwork. It's just shocking to me that you would say you're curating a show of his work. Like how you're going to do that with a good conscience and not have that just looming is this like dark, huge, dark, ominous cloud over everything that you're doing. Especially considering that curators are I think v- extremely thoughtful about that kind of stuff and about context. So I mean, usually they if they're good be. ones. Yeah, they should be. Yeah. Right. On that note, when he was acquitted, I can't remember which gallery it was and I can look it up, but um, he immediately had an art show at a gallery in New York and like just to fucking rub it in, he had, so he shifted the way he was making work to focus on wood mm-hmm. and he had a piece in his show, his first show, after getting acquitted, just adding the drama here of a fucking window. Oh my God. Oh, so just milking it. Just I know. totally milking it. Can you picture the dudes who were in his little dude crew coming to his show and seeing it and probably laughing and being like, oh, Carl, you yeah. didn't. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> they drink some wow. whiskey and laugh. It's so gross. It's also just one of those, like, people can't hide that stuff or they can't just move. I feel like when someone does something like that, like, it it, it will haunt them and show up in places forever. Yeah. He does not do interviews. He lives in a his whatever compound in upstate New York and still has retrospectives, still has a lot of value. But the crowds, which museums depend on when he has a retrospective, will come in and cause mayhem. Mm-hmm. So, well, that makes me happy. Yeah. I like that. I support that. Maybe I should ask the tarot cards. Oh, yeah. What's our tarot card question? Yeah. I'm using the Bergman deck. So it's pretty dark. But, you know, this deck, I like doing, a, I like pulling the cards in such a way that's like I pull one and that's the past of the question. Then the mm-hmm. middle one's the present. And then the third one is the future of it. Just like a three card spread situation. So, what should we ask? Why don't we ask? Like how his how is his work going to be considered in the future is what That's, I want to know. Like what's the arc of, of the consideration of his work? Okay, like great. If if we're in the present right now, we know how it was in the past, and then what's the future? Let's let's just see what it says. Okay. All right, let's see. Carl Andre, if you're listening, the first card is cut, and I'll show it to you. Uh, You remember what these look like. They're black and white. They're just the stills. And there's an image of a female's face. And there's like Mm -hmm. a a slice through it. Like almost like her face is um, on a a window. (laughs) It's It's almost like a broken glass. Or it's definitely a female's face that's cut. Okay. Yeah. Very telling. That's the past. All right. Maybe there's something about the past we don't know. And the cards do. This is true. I think oh. it means that he cut her life short. Oh, that's yeah. That's my interpretation. I like that. Okay, so that's the past. Cut the life short. The present is a picture of a predatorial bird, a hawk of some sort. It says soaring at the bottom, image of a okay. bird just soaring, mm-hmm. just coasting along, mm-hmm. just hanging out. All right, what about his future, though? What's the future. I'm going to wait till I feel a card that is hot. Which I think is this? Okay, I feel it. Okay, this is so weird. What is it? It says freedom in a shell. It is Whoa. a very eerie still of a woman oh, wow. holding a shell to her ear. And she looks like she's about to lose her mind. 
Wow. And that, that is, is very eerie. His future. Freedom in a shell. Dang. That's it, Andre. That's your future. Man, that's a great story. Thank yeah. you, Veronica. I mean, great in that you know what I mean. I mean, it's tragic. It's, it's very sad, but wildly interesting. I want to know more about her and her life. Yeah, I have a feeling there's going to be some, there are going to be some really stellar exhibitions of her work in the future. I uh, hope so. All right, this podcast is brought to you by We Own This Town. Our music's by a Nashvillian named Patrick Dampier. Yes, and our podcast artwork is by a non nashvillian named Saskia Colgis. Yeah, and that's about it. Thanks for listening. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.